Welcome to Conversation. We have a very lovely guest with us today, uh, Madeline A. Bay. She is the Deputy uh, Chief of Police. Welcome, Madeline. Thank you. Welcome. So can you tell our viewers uh, what you typically do in your daily line of work? Well, as a police officer here at Pimpton University, I'm the Deputy Chief of Police. And what that means is I supervise uh, our lieutenants, who then supervise our officers. But my job also entails a lot of our community policing efforts. Mm -hmm. um, we have a community response team that actually coordinates with me. We do a lot of educational programs on campus, like self-defense classes, what to do when you stop by the police, how to survive an active shooter, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Also, a matter of actually having the officers going out and being with the students. So we're at the bus stops at, on weekends. We're at the basketball games. We're in the university union. Mm -hmm. We're going through the residence halls, uh, meeting with RA staff and our students there just to meet and greet and say hi and, and see what's going on. Okay, interesting. And um, this whole theme of community policing, um, even in New York City, um, it's really a new trend in the sense of police um, our daily interactions with police not always being negative mm -hmm. um, in a sense that typically uh, somebody's interaction with police may always be negative. Mm -hmm. uh, you may be getting a ticket, you may be um, getting pulled over, or as this being a, a student uh, university, obviously you have a lot of drugs, you have a lot of alcohol. Mm -hmm. um, what are one of the ways that community policing in your sense is enabling your police department to be more interactive, to be more a part of student lives in a positive way. And like I said, I think it's, it's our officers actually going out and, and talking to students, and just has as we want, you know, people don't the students don't want our officers judging them for you know what they look like, who they are, or just being eighteen to twenty year old students. Mm -hmm. um, we want to make sure that the students aren't doing the same to us that we're just oh they're the cops, they're the uniforms, they're the bad guys. Mm -hmm. You know, just because you may have had a, a bad interaction in your hometown or somewhere else, or even in the city of Binghamton. Mm -hmm. um, doesn't mean you'll have a bad interaction with every police officer, including us. So just getting out and talking is just, you know, we, we encourage our, the students to, and any of the client, you know, clientele, this, the community here on campus, mm -hmm. um, to talk to us too. And, you know, hey, hey officer, how are you? I'm yeah. so-and-so. And, and just that we want our officer to do the same. What is one of the differences between uh, a regular police officer and a campus police officer? And what are some of the jurisdiction issues or differences? Well, I'm going to start with the similarities. Mm -hmm. um, we are a fully trained and empowered police department. Mm -hmm. um, we had we go to the same police academy as Binghamton Police and Broome County Sheriffs and, and so forth. Um, we are, you know, like I said, the real police <laughs> in a sense. <laughs> yeah. um, so that's that, that's the basics that we are the same. We in that sense of any other police officer in New York State or in the country. Mm -hmm. um, what makes us different is the fact that we work in a specific place. Mm -hmm. um, that our students are different. We're not, you know, in, in a city of Binghamton, for example. You've mm -hmm. got not only our students living there, but we have the regular town people. We have the city people who live there, um, the people who do business there, um, the people who commit crimes there as well. Mm -hmm. um, Binghamton Police, for example, is going from call to call to call to call. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times they don't have the time to stop and just talk to people. Yeah. We're here, we're busy, but yeah. we're going call to call. So we have that time in between to mm -hmm. interact and, okay. and do other things besides just report. Yeah. Yeah, respond to crimes and so forth. Yeah, and in terms of responding to crime, um, especially in a university, um, considering a university uh, stereotypically is a time for youth to experiment, to express themselves, mm -hmm. um, what are one of the challenges, you know, one being that there is, a, of course, drug, alcohol mm -hmm. culture, and two being, um, given the recent me media coverage, the negative media coverage of police, of distrust, mm -hmm. that minorities may have, um, what are one of the ways you're trying to tackle that? And, and I, I can say it over again, it's just the getting out and talking to people. Um, a lot of, like I said, our, we have a community response team that one of the things they do is actually go meet with the student association groups. Mm -hmm. They meet with, say, uh, BSU, mm -hmm. with the Caribbean Student Association, with Shades, mm -hmm. with uh, LGBTQ groups, mm -hmm. um, with the Latin Student Union. They're actually going to those events. They're actually going to the meetings and interacting and meeting the students and, they, and introducing each other, in a sense. Mm -hmm. Um, as far as the drugs and alcohol, we were very close to the residential life because that's where most of the stuff is happening is in the residence halls as far as, especially when it comes to the marijuana or alcohol. Mm -hmm. um, and we also recognize that we're not just out enforcing law and arresting people, mm -hmm. we're here for an educational purpose as well. Okay. Uh, we work with the student conduct, which is not a punitive, it's an education. We want to make sure, hey, yeah, we found you drunk off your butt, mm -hmm. um, you came downtown, you're, you're sick. Our main priority is making sure, number one, that you're safe. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not out to say, okay, how old are you? You're underage or anything like that. Yeah. But are you okay? 
do you need help? Mm -hmm. um, especially when it comes to the alcohol issues. And most of the time, we're just sending them to the hospital. It's actually against the law for us to arrest somebody for being underage if oh. the reason they're called is to get them to the hospital. Mm -hmm. um, actually, Binghamton University has had this mm -hmm. policy for the 27 years I've been here mm -hmm. where our main thing is get this person to the hospital. Mm -hmm. There is no, I don't care if you're underage, mm -hmm. I don't care if you can be surrounded by drug paraphernalia. Yeah. We're going to take the drug paraphernalia, yeah. but there's going to be no arrest. No arrest. Because we want to make sure, how can we make sure you're safe, mm -hmm. and how can we make sure this doesn't happen again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so students should always be aware that, you know, if somebody's overdosed on something, to call the police, and that if you call, that you won't be penalized um, for having such substances. And um, it really goes into the, the new epidemic of heroin mm -hmm. and the new New York State policies of uh, if you call and they have the, I don't know what you, there's a certain drug. Narcan. Yeah, Narcan. Mm -hmm. um, and have you experienced that here in Binghamton? Um, we as a university, as a university police have not. We've been carrying naloxone or Narcan for the mm -hmm. past two years. Uh, knock on wood, we've never had to use it. Mm -hmm. um, I know I believe Harper's Ferry may have had to use it a couple times, mm -hmm. um, okay. but the surrounding community, Binghamton, Johnson City, Endicott, those police departments, Broome County Sheriff's Department, they're using it all the time, unfortunately, in this area. Mm -hmm. um, but we've been carrying it for, like I said, for two years. Mm -hmm. We've never had to use it, yeah. and hopefully we'll, that'll continue. Yeah. Now, again, going back to what you said, I've heard stories from businesses that there is people, you know, overdosing in the downtown area. Mm -hmm. And for our off-campus students, what are some of the things they should be aware of in terms of safety? Off-campus, really, said it is very different. On campus, you have the safety of residential life, the RA staff, the locked doors, mm -hmm. even the campus you know, closing down at night where we, we close the gates. It, it, we're a very safe area. But like I said, off-campus, where you're intermingling with the community members, with drug dealers, with gangs, and so forth, they really, students really need to be aware of you know, where they're choosing to live. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, a lot of times they're just convenient to where the buses are, where the downtown bars are. They're not thinking about what's actually in that community. Mm -hmm. But they need to think about that in advance of when they're going to move off campus. Mm -hmm. um, there's actually a crime maps that Binghamton Police has, and we have links to it for the off-campus student, off-campus college, mm -hmm. where you can see the crime maps and so forth. Okay. But the coming down to, you know, locking your doors, being aware of your neighbor, who are your neighbors, mm -hmm. um, traveling in groups, you know, not yeah. go walking out at night by yourself, or even just one or two people. You need to be in like three or four people mm -hmm. um, to be traveling in groups and so yeah. forth. Being aware of your safety, mm -hmm. and just, you know, like I said, that awareness. Um, I always, when I teach self-defense classes, yeah. I always say, number one weapon is your brain, and okay. you've got to be able to use it properly. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, with our students, when they start going to the downtown, to the bars or parties, when they start drinking alcohol, mm -hmm. the brain, that part of your brain kind of gets shut off. Yeah. And, and students need to prioritize what's more important, having a good time drinking, mm -hmm. or is my safety more important? Yeah, I always tell my friends, I always, we call it rolling deep. You got to be rolling deep with a squad. So <laughs> in case one of your friends gets hammered, yes. you're, you're able to, you know, sort of take care of them. Yeah. Um, and making sure that, you know, they go home safely. Right. Now, in, in terms of alcohol, um, especially around female issues um, in a sense of sexual assault, mm -hmm. um, you know, drugs, alcohol, they do play a role. Oh, yes. Um, and, you know, I always, you know, I was always taught, you know, that especially my sisters, you know, you always want to go in a group, you always want to uh, make sure you're in a good situation. Now, what is one of the processes of, you know, of course, we have the conduct board, mm -hmm. um, and given the media coverage of sexual assault, uh, what, are, what are some of the steps Binghamton is taking, and mm -hmm. how is the police department involved in that? Well, we're working with, like I said, student conduct, and also uh, the Dean of Students Office and the Interpersonal Violence Program Office, with the Counseling Center, with Res Life. We actually have um, educational programs for staff. Mm -hmm. so that if student reports, they know who they can report to, mm -hmm. um, what happens if they report to the counseling center versus, say, the dean of students versus the, uh, even the university police. You know, like I say, go to the counseling center or the health services, it's confidential. They can't tell anybody, yeah. just like, you know, HIPAA laws. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas they come to the university police, it's confidential mm -hmm. uh, as, as long as, the, you know, it's the investigation. But we also, hear, if it happens here on campus, we're going to tell somebody, the dean of students, that, hey, this happened, the Title IX coordinator, that this happened on campus, or even have off campus if it's one of our students. Mm -hmm. uh, but they're going to get limited information until, you know, the, the investigation is clear. We, as a university, as police, we are going to investigate as much as the student wants us to. Um, we actually have what we call a victim option form. So the student comes to us and say, hey, you know, I just want it on record, I just want it on paper. I don't even want to name names. They can do that. Um, or they say, hey, you know, this happened to me, this is the person who did it, I want full arrest, and we're going to investigate and make those arrests if we find enough evidence for it. Mm -hmm. um, 
We're also going to make sure that the students have all the resources they need, whether it's counseling, medical information. Um, like I said, even going through the dean of students' office where they can say, hey, you know, this person is so tra traumatized that they can't go to class. Mm -hmm. Can you help us, you know, reach out to professors? That's what the dean of students will do. But so we actually are a, kind of a mm -hmm. nice starting point for a lot of these resources. Okay. Um, but we also, a lot of that things happen off campus. Mm -hmm. So we will help the students connect with, say, Binghamton Police or Broome County or Johnson, wherever it happened, whatever jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. And we'll actually go with them if we, they want us to, to help them, you know, get there, find the place, yeah. you know, find out what other resources are there is to help them as well, or help with the investigation. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times it's the students, they say Binghamton yeah. Police is investigating it, mm -hmm. they'll come to us and say, hey, how can we find this person and, and connect. Okay. Now for our viewers who, you know, watch a lot of politics and the, and the media, mm -hmm. I know Joe Biden has re spearheaded, you know, it's on us campaign. Mm -hmm. um, and there has been, um, I'm not sure if legislation has been passed um, that requires universities to uh, report sexual assault a certain way. Um, has there been any changes that you're aware of? Or um, in the past few years, uh, as reporting goes, we're doing the same thing. We have uh, um, an annual security report that we have to put out from the University Police Department that lists, you know, how many homicides, how many sexual assaults, how many burglaries, how many, you know, things like that. And that has not changed. Mm -hmm. um, it's just a matter of the things that you have to look for when you're, say, you're going to looking at colleges and you look mm -hmm. at your annual security report. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. um, what may see in New York may be different from California okay. because state laws are different, but either way it's a federal program. And the Cleary Report is another thing mm -hmm. um, where we just list certain things that may change from state to state because of different laws, how they're worded and stuff. But we, that, that part hasn't changed. We are still reporting and, and everything like that. Mm -hmm. It's for the most part is the educational programs that we do, that the Dean of Students does, that the Counseling Center, those have mm -hmm. increased um, we're reaching out more, working with the 20 to 1 program here mm -hmm. on campus. Mm -hmm. um, those areas where the education mm -hmm. and the resources and how students access those, those are what's really changed lately. Okay. Now, when I went to your office mm -hmm. and um, I asked uh, to interview somebody um, who's in charge, mm -hmm. um, and um, to my shock, I, was, uh, I always picture uh, police officers being male. Mm -hmm. um, as a woman in the police force, in a high position, mm -hmm. um, what has your experience been and um, what sort of encouragements or um, attributes you can give to other female uh, students who might want to go into the justice system? Okay. Um, I've been very fortunate in that I've been uh, treated well uh, by my peers, by my other people in the area. Um, I haven't had any issues, except for maybe cab drivers who call me honey instead of <laughs> officer. They call the males officer, officer, but they call me honey. Mm -hmm. So I always corrected them on that one. Okay. Um, but I, it's for women, it is definitely a, a wonderful job mm -hmm. um, for some people, depending on where you go. Mm -hmm. uh, for our department, we have four women who work in our department. Mm -hmm. um, right now, three officers and me mm -hmm. as deputy chief. Uh, other departments I know of where there's been only one woman they've had a little difficulty because there's nobody else to talk to, mm -hmm. to express the, the concerns they may have. Mm -hmm. um, depending on where you are, like I said, a larger department where they've had women for years and years, mm -hmm. it's, it's a lot easier. But there's still some men and some old, good old boys, if you want to call it that, that are still out there that still don't believe women should do the job or can do the job mm -hmm. effectively. Mm -hmm. um, I'm actually in a group called New York Women in Law Enforcement. Mm -hmm. And it's a statewide group of women in law enforcement. And we meet every kind of a conference every year. And it's very nice to be in a room with 200 other police women, yeah. whereas normally I'm in uh, groups of, okay, it's me and, and 10 guys or 15 guys or something like that, or mm -hmm. 200 guys. Mm -hmm. and, and so it's very refreshing to see the opposite way. And there are still some issues out there, unfortunately, where uh, because, you know, like I said, you've you got two women in a, in a 40 guy and 40 guys in a department, yeah. They don't have the same resources as far as you know locker room issues or um, just somebody to talk to. Yeah. Um, the the only problems I've had a lot of times is for me, if anything, is I'm not up having all the I'm in office gossip in a sense or what's going on because <laughs> yeah. the guys will talk in a locker room yeah. and I'm in the locker room. It's me by myself. Yeah, it's you know. So in that sense, sometimes it takes a little while for the news to travel to me for yeah. for that kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, or what's you know what are the things the complaints you know people are complaining about or things like that. that yeah. It takes a while. Yeah. Uh, and but for other women, I still think it's you know I'm a I'm a third generation cop. My father was a police officer down in Suffolk County, and he always he'd say, "Women, you need more women, you need more women," because there are so many, especially you know, when it comes to crime victims, mm -hmm. most of them are women. They want to look for another woman who understands maybe where they've been, um, who understands that you know what the weaknesses are, what the, what they can do, mm -hmm. 
and, and just like what it's like to be a mom or what it's like to, you know, so that, that connection is there and, and that's another reason why we just need more women police officers. Yeah. And you don't even have to be a criminal justice major. I mean, I have, I have degrees in, in education, mm -hmm. so I encourage people of all majors to, you know, there's, you're going to find niches in police departments, whether you're computer tech, whether you're education, whether you're uh, speaking another language. Mm -hmm. So not just for women, but for anybody to, to yeah. be in a job. Yeah, and, and studies have shown, you know, that, you know, especially with, you know, Sheryl Sandberg and this push that, you know, for women to be in higher positions. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it has been shown that when you have a diverse group of people, um, business and just um, organizations tend mm -hmm. to be better. You know, yes. as you said, you know, most victims are women. And you have a certain sensitivity, mm -hmm. or a certain perspective that a male might not have, yes. which is really important. And it's the goes, same thing with diversity as far as minorities as well. Mm -hmm. um, we really encourage, we want to recruit uh, black males, Latino males, Asian males, and females as well, mm -hmm. um, LGBTQ people. Mm -hmm. We want to get them into law enforcement for the same reason, that somebody has that understanding, that group. Mm -hmm. and, and if you're working with a coworker who is black or a coworker who is uh, you know, gay, you're going to be able to treat your, and you're like, okay, they're real people too, they're nice people, they get along and they have that same thing. Mm -hmm. And therefore, when you're treating with your clientele, whether it's the bad guys or the good guys, mm -hmm. the victims, you have that better understanding and an easier time working with somebody and talking with somebody. Okay. Um, and that's something that, like I said, law enforcement as a whole, you know, like I said, we're having trouble recruiting okay. minorities of, you know, yeah. of race and sex. Okay. Uh, what are some of the scary situations or some of the risk that your officers are exposed to even in the universities? Um, the biggest thing people think about is an active shooter because mm -hmm. um, it's happened at other college campus or waiting, does it, is it going to happen here? Mm -hmm. And we do prepare for it, we do train for that. Mm -hmm. um, but we have had murders here. Um, we have had s serious physical assaults here. In Binghamton? In Binghamton, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, a few years ago we had a professor that was murdered by one of his graduate students. He was stabbed mm -hmm. in Science 1. Mm -hmm. uh, and our officers had to respond to that, and they caught the bad guy right then and there, mm -hmm. you know, knife in his hand. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I always think about the one time I, when I was working the midnight shift as an officer, mm -hmm. and we got a call to some people up by Hillside in the parking lot, mm -hmm. and they thought they were casing cars. So we go up there and, and take a look and mm -hmm. talk to these two students and say, oh, yeah, we're just walking around. It's 3 in the morning. It's like, you live in New England. Why are you doing up here? Oh, we're just bored. Mm -hmm. And we just ID'd them and said, all right, get out of here, go home. And just as they turned around, I looked around and I saw something underneath the tire, and they had a gun down there. And I'm like, okay, I just dealt with guys who just had guns in their hands, you know. So it turned out to be a pellet gun. They were out shooting signs, but still, mm -hmm. you can't tell one gun from the other. Mm -hmm. It was still one of those things. Okay, I just dealt with this kid who could have had that gun, even if the pellet gun could have shot me. Mm -hmm. So we're always prepared for. We never know what's going to happen, who we're yeah. going to deal with. And our campus is an open campus. I mean, BC Transit buses come through here, so community members are on here. So it's not just students. Mm -hmm. um, we have a lot of students that we've dealt with that are, you know, suicidal. Mm -hmm. So we don't know, they're not just going to take pills, they're not just going to drink, sometimes they will have a weapon. Mm -hmm. um, so we deal with that kind of possibility every day. Mm -hmm. But I think the biggest thing we always, you know, like I said, this community, people yeah. are worried about the, the active shooter. Mm -hmm. And like I said, for Binghamton, we've had it. You know, in the city of Binghamton, there's been an active shooter. Uh -huh. uh, where at the American Civic Association, 13 people died. Wow. Um, so it's close to home and that happens here. So a lot of our community, especially our staff, are very, cognizant of that. Mm -hmm. Now going with that, a lot of active shooters, a lot of people who do need help, um, it goes back into the mental health mm -hmm. and um, I know uh, O'Connor, um, a lot of students have been um, complaining um, that there's not enough services, mm -hmm. but just beyond that, um, in general, has your department partnered with um, mental health um, institutions to ensure that people who are stressed or can get the resources. Yes, um, we partner right, right here on campus with the Student Counseling Center, the mm -hmm. University Counseling Center. Mm -hmm. um, we work with them. We also have, like I said, with the Dean of Students, runs what they call a Student Concern Committee, and we are an active participant of that. And say a student is either, you know, like I said, either the university is police, we've res responded to somebody who is, you know, suicidal, depressed, whatever, mm -hmm. or somebody calls us, mm -hmm. or even a faculty member can talk about a student, hey, you know what, this student you know, isn't doing as well at class, they're not engaging anymore, something's not quite right, or they said, put something in writing in their, in their writing classes, mm -hmm. they can refer to Student Concern Committee. Mm -hmm. And this committee is made up of police, the counseling center, health services, residential life, um, faculty members, mm -hmm. um, and they'd say, all right, how can we, what does this person, this student need? Do they need counseling? Do they need to go to the crisis center at Binghamton General? Mm -hmm. Do they need to have mom and dad come and get them? Mm -hmm. um, do they need just this, you know, all right, they just need somebody to talk to. Maybe they have financial aid issues. They talk to financial aid. Um, 
And as, as a group, we figure, okay, is this happening just in one place? Is it happening in several places where the students are having issues? Mm -hmm. And like I said, we refer to getting the help they need. Mm -hmm. um, part of this committee is also a threat assessment team. Mm -hmm. So where we have somebody who say has made threats to other people, whether it's a faculty staff or they you know, themselves as well, mm -hmm. that they're going to hey they are potential active shooters. Where this smaller threat assessment team with mm -hmm. conduct and police and, and counseling yeah. gets together and say they can make this person have mandatory counseling, mandatory assessment. Mm -hmm. We can, like I said, we'll you know as a police we can start doing that little more background checks, mm -hmm. saying is this person a danger? Does this person need to you know? Yeah be kicked out of campus, do they need to go to jail, be arrested, you know, mm -hmm. whatever, and determine, you know, they're they're not welcome here or, hey, you know, we can't help them. This isn't is what we thought it is, it's something different. Uh, is your department any way related to uh, the parking department, uh, giving out tickets? Um, we work with them. They are they actually in the students uh, student affairs. They used to actually be part of our department, but then they've separated out. They're on their own entity now in okay. student affairs. But we do work with them. Obviously, our uh, our officers will write tickets for like the commuter lots overnight, or mm -hmm. we see something during the day, hey, somebody's in a handicapped spot. Mm -hmm. If we see it before parking services does, we can write the tickets with them. Mm -hmm. um, and we help them, like when they have to boot a car because somebody hasn't paid their parking tickets or a car towed, mm -hmm. we will go with them because a lot of times when people find their car booted, or towed, they're not very happy. So we're there to kind of back them up to make sure everybody's safe. Mm -hmm. uh, but for the most part, they're their own entity. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know if you know the, the stat. Um, does Binghamton get like 15% of revenue from parking? No. <laughs> no. Just a, is this no, a lure? <laughs> in fact, it even comes to writing parking tickets, not parking, like stop sign tickets and speeding tickets. Yeah. We get nothing. Everything uh -huh. goes to the courts and, and the town. Uh, so there's no incentive, you know. End yeah. of the month, they got to watch yeah, out. There's you know. no quota. Okay. Now, uh, lastly, a very uh, serious question. Mm -hmm. um, when when uh, you're driving and you know you see flashing lights, mm -hmm. and uh, and a police officer you know knocks on your window, and you know license registration, right. um, what is the best way to get out of a ticket? <laughs> <laughs> the best way is to be nice. To be nice. <laughs> it is to cooperate. You say, yeah, you got me. Here's my, you know, yeah. Um, what can I do? I'm sorry. Uh, not to argue, not to yeah. put up a fuss, not to, you know, say you're only stopping me because I'm a student, or yeah. you're only stopping me this, and, and yeah. it is to cooperate. Just um, to and that's just not just for for traffic stops, for anything. anything. Um, most of our students, if if they're cooperative, if they're nice, they say, "Yep, here you got me. What can I? I'm sorry, I won't do it again." Or mm -hmm. you know, how can I make sure this happened? You know, what can I do? Yeah. Um, a lot of times they'll go through the conduct instead of being mm -hmm. arrested or yeah. something like that. It, yeah. it's, it's when you start getting, you know, if you're nice to me, I'm nice to you. Okay. If you're nasty to me, I'm still nice to you, but you don't like the outcome. Uh, <laughs> That's what okay. I usually tell people. Yeah, and uh, yeah, it's just uh, real quick. It's um, it's very interesting. Do you, do your cops go and you know have training to just hide? I, <laughs> I feel as if like, like you're, you're too good. It's just too good. I, like, sometimes I'm just walking. I'm like. He fit over there, and I'm just yep. like. Oh. We have to be very careful about where where we set up our you know our patrol cars because we have to make sure that we're not at, blocking traffic somewhere. Mm -hmm. We have to be out of the way, and yeah, yeah we do want to kind of sneak up on people when we can. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's been a great pleasure, great honor. Yes, thank you yeah, very th much. Thank you for your service. You're right. uh, Thank you for joining us.